Open your Bibles to Psalm 119.11. Time for you to get here, Sherry. Likely excuse. Psalm 119.11. Jehovah Zeboeth, the Lord of hosts. Dun, da, da. Yes. When um, we were at coordinators and talking about teachings, you know, the, the redemptive names of Jehovah, everybody was picking this one and that one and this one. I'm like, what, Sid? And he's like, why don't you take Jehovah Zeboeth? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, and I'm a thief when I teach. I always teach from other people's teachings. Guess what? I couldn't find a teaching on Jehovah Zeboeth. <laughs> Sid, what am I supposed to do? So what do we do when we lack wisdom? Ask God. Ask God. So and this has been a fun journey through the Lord of hosts for me. I hope I can impart some of my enthusiasm and some of the fun that I've had with this topic to you um, about our magnificent and wonderful God, Lord of hosts, Jehovah Zeboeth. Um, so, well, you got to say it real hard. Well, the first thing I did is I pulled out my Strong's Concordance, and I looked in the back where it's the, the Hebrew words are transliterated, and I'm looking for the Z's. There is no Z in the Hebrew. It's T-S, so it's got to be a hard thing. So Zeboeth. You guys got that? Zeboeth. you gotta, you got to get that going. So Psalm 1911. Oh, I'm in the wrong page. Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So what does this have to do with the, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Zeboeth? Nothing or everything. Because we study God's word. We look at different aspects of God's word to fully understand, to give us better understanding of who our God is and what he has planned for us. Uh, we look at God's word, like 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we're looking at these things that may look obscure, Jehovah and the sea, uh, you know, some of the other things, that, but to better understand God's heart for us. Um, Strong's Concordance defines Zeboeth, hosts, as a mass of persons, especially organized for war. And it's also translated throughout the Bible, that word Zeboeth, as army, battle, company, service, soldiers, warfare. There's a definite military connotation to it. Dr. Werwell, in Living Victoriously, described it, Jehovah is the head of it. That was what he said. E.W. Bullinger, in his companion Bible, and 1 Samuel 1, let's turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 1, verse 3, this is the first usage of Jehovah Zeboeth in the Bible. And typically in our biblical understanding, we go to the first usage to understand what this is. So, but E.W. Bullinger in his companion Bible has a note that it's the first of 281 occurrences. So we're going to go through all of those tonight. <laughs> Did you bring your pillows? No. We're just going to get a few. But it also denotes the God of Israel as the Lord of hosts of heaven and earth. So this first usage, 1 Samuel 1, 3, And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So I'm scratching my head. That really doesn't give us a whole big understanding of this word. Let's look at Genesis. Genesis 2. This is just host, Zeboeth. Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Does that give you a little bit bigger picture? The host of them. Um, <clears throat> our, our Lord is magnificent. He's a majesty and strong and mighty. Let's look, we're going to look into the scope of the Lord of hosts. Sid had talked about scope on the opening teaching. And we're looking at the scope of this word, Jehovah Zeboeth. And uh, then we'll go into 
uh, some of the New Testament and Jesus Christ. So let's look at, well, first of all, let's go back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17, this is not in your syllabus, but it's <clears throat> where David has come up against Goliath and the armies of the Philistines are just scaring and, and Goliath is just scaring the Israelites. He's scaring God's people. And David, this young shepherd, comes up in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45. And he says, Then David, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. He came in the name of the Lord of hosts. Let's go to Psalm, Psalm 24. We'll see some of the other aspects of the Lord of hosts. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. And I put in my notes 8. We're going to start in verse 7. I sometimes trick you like that. Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The Lord of hosts, that's one of the things, one of the attributes. He is the king of glory. Let's go to Amos, <laughs> Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. In the clean part of your Bible. And the unused part. Amos 4. Amos 4, verse 13. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what his thoughts that maketh the morning of darkness and tread upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Whoa. Uh, go over a few books to Haggai or if you want to go to Matthew and come back three books. <laughs> Haggai. Haggai 2. Haggai, in Haggai, um, Israel, the remnant is coming out of Babylonian captivity. And this is the book of Haggai addresses that. Haggai 2, verse 4. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. God is with them. Keep reading. According to the word that I coveted with you when ye came out of Egypt. You know, God promised them when, he came out of, when they came out of Egypt that he would take care of them. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens. It's going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with the glory, saith the Lord of hosts. He's going to fill us with glory. Um, go to the next book, Zechariah. Zechariah 13. This came to me when Jimmy Davis was teaching on the shepherd. And right here. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Let's go to Isaiah 13. Greg read 13, 2, I think. But we're going to look at Isaiah 13, 4. This is um, the book of Isaiah. God is telling his people to come back to him so they don't get taken over, so they don't get 
um, Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity. God is encouraging them and, and talking to them. And in verse 4, Isaiah 13, 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of battle. See, they're getting, God's, God's got that power, that might, and that majesty. Let's turn to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29 <clears throat> and verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as a shaft that passeth away. Yea, it shall be as an instant, suddenly, thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquakes and great noise with storm and tempest and flame of devouring fire. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, let's turn to Isaiah 44. <laughs> Are you guys awake yet? Are you awake? Isaiah 44. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who, as I shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them, fear not, again talking about the, the armies, the ensuing armies, fear not, neither be afraid, have I not told thee from that time, and have declared it, ye are even my witness, is there a God beside me? Yay, there is no God. I know not any. Let's go back to 40, uh, verse 6. We're going to read that one more time. There is no other God. There is one God. Verse 6, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the King of Israel, and Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is how many gods? No other gods. One God. Let's look at Isaiah 47. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Isaiah 47, 4. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. But um He's in 44, 6, he was the king of Israel. Here he's the holy one of Israel. Let's look at Isaiah 51. 51, 15. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. Ba -ba. Ba -bam. My fellowship's supposed to be watching me to know to do that. But anyway, um, <laughs> he divided the sea. The Lord of hosts is his name. In the book of Isaiah, Lord of hosts, Jehovah Zeboeth, is used over 60 times. In the book of Jeremiah, it's used over 80 times. They're both books where they've got ensuing armies coming in. And if the people would just turn back to God, God would take care of them. The Lord of hosts would protect them and take care of them. Let's look at uh, chapter 54, Isaiah 54 and verse 4. Fear not. For, there shall, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt not forgive the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the repro reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. See that? We've seen the Redeemer come up three different verses. We're going to look at it a little bit more. Let's go into Jeremiah. 
On our way to Jeremiah 50, we're going to start at Jeremiah 15, because I can. <laughs> Jeremiah 15, 16, a familiar verse to us. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Huh? There you go. There you go. Jeremiah 50. God wants to be our redeemer. He wanted to be Israel's redeemer, and he was in many instances. Jeremiah 50 and verse 34. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together, and all that took them captives held them fast. They refused to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause, that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. The Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Redeemer, this word is the, uh, the Hebrew word ga'ah. It means a kinsman redeemer. God redeemed Israel many different times. He wanted to be their redeemer. He wanted to bring them out of the soup. Um, <clears throat> it's, let's look in Exodus 6 real quick. This is the second usage of the word ga'ah. Exodus 6. And verse 6, and this is Moses. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. That's our strong and mighty Lord. There's a fly up here. Um, look, while we're here in Exodus 15, 1513. I think someone else read this. That's okay. We can read it again. Exodus 1513. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength and unto thy holy habitations. They, God was their redeemer. He acted as their ga'ah, their kinsman redeemer. If you want to look at this further, there is a book back on the table by Daniel Bader, Redemption, How I Love to Proclaim It. It talks about the word ga'ah and the other words for redemption. The Greek word is lutrosis. We're going to look at it here in a second. I also, there's a teaching from uh, Harrisburg Family Camp 2014. Ray Myers went through the Kinsman Redeemer in a double, double teaching set, and he really set forth the kinsman redeemer and their responsibilities, their rights, their privileges. We're going to look at them briefly. We're not going to go into the scripture, but I've got them here listed. The kinsman redeemer in Levit Leviticus 25, it talks about if I was poor and I had to sell a possession, I could have a kinsman redeemer come in and buy it back. If I was so poor, I had to sell myself and my family into slavery, and I had a kinsman redeemer that was able, he could come in and buy me and my family out of the slavery. A kinsman redeemer could avenge the death of his kinsman, and a kinsman redeemer was needed to raise up a son to someone who had died without an heir. God's people needed to be redeemed because of Adam's egregious sin and betrayal, there was no one on earth to act as the kinsman redeemer. There was no one, Adam had died spiritually. There was no one to carry on to raise up a spiritual heir unto him. There was no one to buy him back out of slavery of sin and death that he had sold himself into. There was no one to buy back the possession, the dominion of the earth that he had sold to the adversary. And there was no one to avenge his spiritual death. God had to act as the redeemer. Turn to Luke. Luke 1.
Luke 1. Luke 1 in verse... <clears throat> We're going to actually start in 67. This is Zacharias, the, son, the, the father of John the Baptist. When Zacharias was doing the um, job of a priest in the temple and doing whatever priests do in the temple, um, Gabriel appeared to him. And he was old, and he said, about this time, you and your wife will have a son. They were both old, and Zacharias doubted. Now, I don't understand this because Abraham fell on the floor laughing, you know, and Sarah. But because of Zacharias' unbelief, he was dumb until the baby was born. And when the baby was born, you know, he had been dumb all this time, the people around said, well, we're going to name him Je Zacharias. We're going to call him Zacharias. And uh, Elizabeth said, not so. His name shall be John. And when Zacharias called for a tablet and he wrote, his name is John, and immediately he could speak again. And not only that, but... Verse 67, Luke 1, 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Jesus Christ had not been born at this point, but God gave Zacharias this prophecy. Verse 69, and hath raised up in a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke, spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered, that we being rescued, that we being redeemed out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. This was our Jesus Christ. This was our Redeemer. I, you know, God was the kinsman Redeemer and he sent Jesus Christ to to act as the kinsman redeemer, to pay the price. He was also the lamb and paid the price with his life. Let's look at Hebrews 9. Before this time, when people needed to atone for their sins, they had to sacrifice goats and bulls. But after Jesus Christ, Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ being come, an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is an eternal redemption. It's not something that has to be done yearly. It's not sacrifices that have to be done yearly. Uh, look at Romans 3. Now what does this have to do with Lord of Hosts? We'll get there. We'll get there, I promise. Romans 3. Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through, re, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. This is our redemption. I like in verse 25, I don't remember who talked about propitiation, was the mercy seat. Jesus Christ has taken on all the aspects of the redeemer and of the lamb that needed to be sacrificed. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. 
but of him, of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Colossians. Let's turn to Colossians. Colossians 1. I have a real hard time picking verses out of Colossians 1 and Ephesians 1 because you want to just read the whole chapter because it just all runs together and makes it so dynamic. But we're going to just hit a few verses here. Colossians 1, verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which may, hath made us meet or made us adequate to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us, he's rescued us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Let's get down to verse 18. And he is the head of the body. Wait a minute. Jehovah Zeboeth was the head of it. He has conferred over to Jesus Christ to be the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why? For it pleased the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. And, and this word, the Father, it's in italics, but all through the Old Testament, People had to refer to God, Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah, yeah, all the other Jehovahs, El, Elohim, El Shaddai. But what do we call God? Father. Father. We're able to call him Father. And let's close out tonight in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, the greatest run-on sentence. But we're going to start in verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom, in the beloved one, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness, the remission of sins according to the riches of his grace. Get down to verse 12. That we should be, that our lifestyle should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who first trusted in Christ? God. God first trusted in Christ to set up the whole way of redeeming his people. In whom, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Skip down to verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Think of Lord of hosts. Ta -da! His exceeding greatness. This is God's exceeding greatness towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Again, Jesus Christ is the head of all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. Amen. Amen. Amen.